Thank you very much, Chef Don. It's so good to be back with all of you in person. I have missed seeing you in person and face to face. While we've been doing the classes on Zoom, it's just not the same as the energy in this room. And you are so lucky because you have one of the best programs in the state. You have these instructors that were behind me here that have worked in the industry and who really prepare you for, for a great career in, culinary, in the culinary profession. The Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation, as Don said, and he serves on our advisory board, is a nonprofit, and our whole mission is all of you. Because without all of you out there going into the industry and working for great chefs like the chef we have with us today, uh, the culinary industry doesn't have a future. You are our future. So we want these programs to inspire you and to motivate you to um, get into the profession because we really need you. Because that's what's going to take Hawaii to that next level of culinary and your instructors are preparing you for that. While we do education both at the community colleges, Don said, at the high schools and with professionals, the, these classes are what are really true to um, our programming. And um, we're very fortunate to have with us today one of your graduates, which is awesome. And he also serves on your uh, advisory council here at Leeward Community College, Chef Eric Odo. And his background is impressive. And he's worked at some of the top resorts here in Hawaii from the Four Seasons, the Kahala, the Hale Kulani, and now at G Lion, where he is executive chef. And we're very honored and pleased to have him with us today. He has a great passion for fishing, which I share a passion for fishing. I grew up fishing as well, and I grew up on a farm, so I have great respect for how you treat animals and fish when you harvest them. And he's going to share an ancient practice with you, a Japanese practice, of how to respectfully harvest and treat uh, fish so that you can reflect that on the plate when you're presenting it. When you have respectfully harvested an animal or fish, then it certainly is reflected in the food that you serve. And he's going to illustrate that today, and you're going to get to taste it on the plate. So great pleasure to introduce to you from G Lion, Chef Eric Odo. Thank you. All right, thank you for that really nice introduction. Um, yeah, so I've been, uh, it's been a long time since I was in that seat, about 20 years ago. Um, and that's when I first met Chef Don. I think I was in my first semester um, as a culinary student, uh, paired with a fourth semester. And one of the, the lead fourth semester students got sick, and I ended up having to take the lead role in that project that we're paired with Chef Don. So, um, I've actually worked with all the instructors here for at least a good few years now. Um, so super excited to be here. Um, super excited to be in person. I know it's COVID has been um, some struggling, so I had some challenges. So I'm super excited to be the first chef back from COVID. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about um, the art of Ikejimi and what that is, um, why it's important. It's actually a new art for myself um, and how I just kind of started to get into it. Um, practicing it on my own as well, and how I hopefully start a movement of chefs to continue and practice that art as well um, for, uh, to sell fish and also to just kind of give their respect to the animal as well. So um, this is what the agenda is basically going to be. I'll talk a little bit about myself, about me growing up, uh, a little bit about my uh, resume and my career, um, what is Ikijime, the process, um, and then we're going to the sampling part. Uh, I'll be doing a quick uh, fish fillet, showing um, how the whole fish, and then do a crudo with that. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit about the restaurants that I work with. Uh, so we, I run two restaurants, Kiora and La Vie. Um, and then we're going to go into questions and answers. So, all right. So it's about me, a uh, little about me. I was here in 2002, so everybody knows how old I am now. So literally 20 years ago when I first started here. This room was like all small offices, I remember. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you guys are so lucky to have the facilities you guys have. Pearl didn't look like how Pearl was. Uh, we had like a small little hole in the wall room. So um, just wanted to let you guys know you guys are so lucky. Um, super jealous as well. Um, I did some small um, helping out some people in small, smaller um, bars and stuff. But I, my first real job was at the Hale Kalani. I started as a komi, kind of like utility cook work all different positions, anywhere, anytime. I was just that uh, person. Um, they kind of worked my way up. I then took uh, the lead 
um, as a banquet sous chef. So banquets actually help me tremendously when I do buffets and events now. That background is so important. Um, I truly highly recommend you get a, at least a little bit and get to see some ban banquets as well. Um, after that, I, be I went to Orchids. Um, it's a four-star um, restaurant in the Halekulani. Now it's an Italian restaurant. Back when I was still working there, it was like a global cuisine. So kind of like Pan-Asian a little bit, but very global. Um, then I took the opportunity to be one of the opening uh, team, uh, management team at the Four Seasons. Uh, so I opened Fish House before it was even open. It was like still under construction when I first signed up with that team. Um, and then I had an opportunity to take over uh, the Chef de Cuisine at Hoku's. And then now I am at G-Lion. Uh, we currently run La Vie, um, Cura, and then we also um, partnership with Highs as well. So they're part of our um, restaurant group as well. Um, so how I started in the industry. Actually, a lot of my background was growing up was outside of the kitchen. I, from a very young age, uh, my dad fished, and he was also a farmer. He had his own, he had his own nursery. So growing up, I was surrounded with vegetables. I always grew my own vegetables. I was always, um, as a kid, my dad would take me fishing. Uh, and what, what that led me into, like, I wanted to eat the fish that I caught, right? So my dad's like, well, if you're going to, one, if you're going to kill it, make sure you eat it. Make sure you treat it with respect and make sure you don't waste anything. So from head to tail, bones, heads, all that was used and still utilized to this very day. And keep that philosophy continued as well um, to respect of him. Um, so yeah, going to uh, me fishing, um, growing up, when I caught fish, this is what my bucket would look like, right? You would catch a fish, throw it in a bucket, it dies and grows and throw it in a cooler. That's how most people, um, that's how I grew up and that's all I ever knew. Um, and so this is kind of how, you know, whether you're a recreational fisherman or you're a commercial fisherman, like, you know, obviously you're not gonna kill each one separately um, go through the whole Ikijime process. Um, but this picture shows kind of how, you know, every day how an industry runs, whether you're a local fisherman fishing from home or uh, a commercial fisherman. Okay, so I'm going to talk about going into the Ikijime. So Ikijime is a very old uh, fish killing process. It started 350 years ago um, in Japan. It is basically the most humane way, or believe the most humane way to kill a fish. And with that is, uh, it really, it's a biochemical reaction in the fish. And what that does is, it's really trying to reduce any stress that happens into the fish. So whether, it's not just fish, whether you, um, you know, if you, everybody eats chicken, everybody eats pigs, everybody eats um, beef, but how all those animals, any animal is killed, you want to re reduce the amount of stress to the animal. Right. Um, what that does is when, the, when any animal feels stress, they release um, this chemical called um, cor cortisol, which then is like a fight or flight, right? It's like if you get scared and your heart starts beating, there's um, what they call like this lactic acid buildup. If you're like running a sprint, right, your heart starts beating and all, there's a lot of adrenaline in your body. So that's what you're trying to reduce. So this is a, a great image. Um, the ikijime literally translates to brain spike. Um, and how do you find the brain is there's a lateral line, um, preperculum line, right? Right in this gill plate, right? And there's another one that goes right there. And that's basically where you want to pin the fish, which is sticking your brain in the spike. Um, I'll go into the next picture. Um, this, this is a, so all the crudo that you'll be eating, um, today, I actually went fishing and caught all the fish for all of you. So every single fish that you're eating, yes. I personally went on my boat, um, caught, killed each one of it. And um, it is all popio. So I caught um, all the popio you're eating is literally all caught and not bought. So uh, just it's super special. And I just wanted to share that, just my upbringing, and there's something, something special about it as well. And you get to try literally two different methods of fish. Um, so ikijime is basically, what you're trying to do is kill the fish with a brain, sorry, I should have made a disclaimer before. Anybody gets grossed out, 
Anybody gets grossed out, can't handle blood. It is a little gory. Um, I was going to show you a video originally, and, and it was a little too gory. And my wife was like, uh, maybe you should just do a PowerPoint. So this is what I ended up doing. Um, so if anybody, um, just give me a heads up. If anybody gets a little woozy or whatever, um, you might want to turn around or step aside for a little bit. OK, so where you want to hit the brain? What's nice with a popio is it literally shows you where a lateral line is. You can see this, and it goes up. And this is what the lateral line is. And this is the where, um, if you see this part, that's exactly where you want to hit that fish. OK? It's right there. Um, as you see, cut the fish. Um, please notice that I have a cushion, and I'm using a towel. So the reason why that's important is you don't want to bruise the fish. Any type of bruising, um, again, it's inhibiting opportunity for bacteria to enter the fish. And the more bruising is the more spread of the blood. You're trying to reduce the amount of um, handling. And also, it's good to use a towel, not one, not to just get cut, but it also your hands are warm. You want to just keep the fish as um, least handled as possible. So in Japan, if you ever went to Tsukiji, they do it in seconds. I, I, it takes me. It takes, takes me a few minutes, but they're really professionals. They can do it in seconds. Um, you'll see it. like They cut, boom, boom, cut the tail, and stick the wire through. So here it is. Um, the next step is you want to bleed it. Um, you can cut. You want to cut the gills and then cut that connection. You'll see all the blood pumping, especially when the fish is fighting after you catch it on a, on a line and pole. And again, it's, it's because it's fighting. It's exercising. It's like you guys go for a hard sprint your heart's going to be beating fast. And what you want to do is want to pump up all that blood. Blood carries a lot of bacteria, right? So you want to reduce, what, what, what you're doing is you want to reduce the amount of bacteria that is um, in the fish. Um, OK, so normally, if you throw in the, in the cooler, right, going back into fish dies from suffocation, lack of oxygen. And with that is the fish can be, it can be five minutes, or it can be up to two hours where the fish can still be almost still alive, like taking its last breath. If you've ever seen a fish in the bucket, I remember like an hour later you're going back. It's like, oh, it's still somewhat alive yet. you know. Um, but me knowing what I know now, it is not the most humane way of killing the fish. OK, let's go. OK, so the next step is this is a perfect picture in this one. Um, this is where the neural canal is, right here. On the, on the top of the fish, this is where it is. That's where you want to push a wire through. If you see, there's a wire. And once you push it through, you're literally severing the neural canal. So it's, it's, what you're doing is it, it helps. That wire is preventing any stress signals from signaling the rest of the, um, the, the fish. And when you hit it, you're going to just feel that fish shake. Um, it's, you don't think it's humane, but it is. It, it's, if you actually see it, it's a good thing you didn't see the video, because um, it is pretty torturous. OK, so why is this step important? Um, anybody know what ATP is, or like rigor mortis, when some, an animal dies? You ever see like a dead animal, like a, sh like a roadkill, like the body's all stiff, right? That's what happens when the animal goes into rigor. Um, it's like post-mortem, basically, of, of an animal. Um, and with that is um, you're basically slowing down that process. Uh, trying to just kill that fish as fast as possible, reduce um, any of that blood that's getting into the fish. Last step is literally just ice brine, which is basically a one-to-one. -one. Um, I should have submerged that fish better, but I just kind of threw it in for that picture. Um, but you want to get that core temperature as down and cool that fish as fast as possible. Um, so again, trying to plump that blood out. There is a one step that I missed that I'll show you when I do the fish. When you cut the blood, you kind of want to raise the tail and kind of keep that up and then kind of try to pump all that blood out. I know it's a little gruesome when I'm talking about it, but uh, at the end product, it really does shine. Um, so what you'll be tasting is fish that went through suffocation. I just threw it in the cooler in the ice, and the fish that I actually did ikijime with. Um, due to the fish being still fresh, I only caught it, what, three days ago? Um, it's a little hard to taste the difference. I actually wanted to age it at least a week. And that's when you can really, really taste the difference. Um, 
you know, the fish that's just killed through suffocation, you're going to get the ammonia and that fishy smell that starts coming out. Um, fish through ikejime um, is, you can even age it over for a week and won't, you can still eat it sashimi. It's kind of like, kind of crazy. Um, so with that also is like, how does this relate into every, the fish that you buy at the restaurants? Right? Um, so if Brooks was here, who runs the uh, fish auction, when I went there at the fish auction one time, I was like, hey Brooks, how come I looked at the fish board? I was like, why does local fishermen, someone like me, goes out on a boat, catches a 100 pound ahi, get less money per pound than a long line fisherman that's been out for two weeks? Same fish, same weight, my fish is fresher, I just caught it yesterday. Why does a fisherman get less fish than a boat that's been out two weeks? Does anybody know the answer? Are they selling a boat? Excuse me? Are they selling a boat? They're not selling a boat. It's all about, it's the same fish. It's just looking at that one fish. Um, yes, so that is a good part of it. Um, but it's the stress of the fish. So when, when someone's trolling, right, you ever, watch, you ever watch Let's Go Fishing or something, when they're trolling for ahi, mahi, all that, like local fishermen, when they're hooking it, the fish is taking, they're hooking it and the fish runs, right? It's like exercising. It's pumping all that blood, right? Um, and what, if the fishermen don't take, and most fishermen don't use this method, and I just really hope to start that movement of fishermen using this method to get one, the better quality of fish, most humane for the fish, the most respect for the fish. And I, th I truly believe if, if this was required by fishermen, um, they would be able to get their prices higher as well. Um, so the long liners, what they do is the fish, there's this long bunch of, there's miles and miles of um, long line. And then what it is is a swivel with these hooks. The fish is swimming around in circles. They're not stressed. They're just like, they don't even know it's hooked. They're just swimming, right? So when they, when they, when they, when they're pulling up the fish, the fish is killed almost instantly. And then they gut it. They cut. They literally cut the heads off, or cut the guts off, and they pack it with ice immediately. And then you know, so they do all this process. It's it's the stress level of the fish. What what you'll find is the reason why local fishermen, even though the fish is way fresher, is because if you let it sit for one, two, three days, the meat actually turns to can turn to mush sometimes. Um, if the fisherman, it can look fresh the day, but when you take it home and you let it sit for two, three days, it just, it turns and it spoils a lot faster than a long line fish. And that's why you'll see that why um, local fishermen won't get as much money per pound, even though it's five, six a week fresher than the long line fish. So it's pretty crazy. How do they know they're actually getting it? Like, are they documenting when they do. they're caught? Yeah, so all the fish um, on long line are actually caught. They have a quota per section um, in each um, area in the, in the ocean as well. And so they're only allowed to harvest X amount of pounds. Um, it's like a pretty sustainable fishery, actually, in that aspect. So, okay. Uh, so these are um, four steps. Um, again, brand spiking, bleeding. Uh, passing the wire and ice brining. Um, is there any other questions before I start going into the demo? Yes. With the wire process, are you pulling along the entire spine? Yes. So there's actually good question. I did, sorry, I forgot to mention that. In, sorry, in this one, um, you can actually set, buy it on Amazon. The kit that I have, it's a wire kit. There's two ways to enter it. You can enter the wire through the brain which I found it's very hard to find. It's like you have to find that perfect sweet spot. The easiest way I found to do it is to poke it, cut the tail off and poke it through there. But you'll, you'll literally, once you push it through, the fish will shake and you'll go all the way. When you measure the wire, you can, you can push the wire and hold it. And when you take out the wire, the wire will literally be that long. So you know you, you went all the way through. I actually should have brought the whole kit with me to actually show you folks that whole process. But. 
Okay. I'm going to give any other questions before we continue? Yes. So when you're going to the fish, op fish auction, if you told the auctioneer that you did EPG May, uh, would that boost up your pricing or renting? See, that is something that hopefully um, we can start changing. There, um, that hasn't been yet. And the fish auction is some, if a local fisherman, what they do is they do measure core temperature. So if a fisherman goes off the boat trolling, brings their fish to the auction, they will stick a probe in. And if it's not, um, I think what, 30, there's like, I think, I don't know the exact number, the 39 degrees internal temperature, they will not take your fish. They'll turn you away, say, sorry, we can't buy your fish, right? So same as even when, even as a purchaser, someone like Jason, if you guys order fish for the restaurant, you know, when, when you're receiving it, it'd be good for you folks to like take a temperature as well. You know, like, hey, this fish is not cold, send it back, you know? So just keep that in mind. Like you always wanna make sure that there's a constant temperature control um, for quality. Any other questions? You guys got more questions, come on. Um, we'll, we'll continue more questions after. Um, but I wanted to just kind of show you, um, actually, I didn't get to introduce Robert. Robert actually works at Cura Restaurant with me. And then there's Jen back there who does our marketing as well. Um, so actually, Ro Ro there's, so what, what you're gonna be able to taste is, um, I have two, I have prepared all the uh, slices of fish. Sorry. So let's put one of each. You're going to taste um, one that's with suffocation and one with ikijimi. Hopefully, you can taste a slight difference. Um, unfortunately, the fish hasn't aged enough to really, really taste the difference. When you get a fish about at least five to a week old, that's when you can really, really taste the difference of the fish. You can have the normal one have a little bit more ammonia smell, and what's gonna happen is the Ikejimi one has a lot more umami. Um, also keep in mind that when you take, when you, after you brine it, when you come off the boat, or you come, you know, you go back home, you wanna take the fish out of the ice. You don't wanna keep on, you don't wanna keep that fish in that wa salt water slurry. You wanna initially put it in there to keep it the fastest way to core the temperature down, but you don't wanna keep it in there. You want to actually take it out, uh, pat it dry, and then keep it in an ice box um, without, without any ice on it. Um, I know some people um, you know, say pack it on ice. I know, you know it's been a practice. But um, for Ikejime, you want to actually keep that fish on the, like, not pack it on ice and kind of like age, kind of like air dry it almost. So, okay. Yes. So, um, why do you have the, the salt and the ice? So the salt actually makes the water a little colder. Um, so if you, you know, if you ever had to calibrate something, if you calibrate a thermometer in one that has ice and one doesn't, the one with the salt actually will be colder. So again, it's just trying to bring down that core temperature as much as possible. Okay, any other questions? All right. One glove. You ever need a skipper? Yeah, go ahead. Actually, this fish is about four days already. Um, Will you hold it up? Yeah. So I can just. That's a nice. Um, we can still. It still has some nice color yet. Um, this is actually the probably the smallest fish of the fish that I kept for that day. And so. How many pounds did they share? Huh? Say maybe about almost two pounds, yeah. And then if we can just put some mold in, and then the um, yeah, mold in is on boat, okay. and then a little bit of lemon oil. Gotcha. 
Have you guys done um, fish filleting yet in school? Oh, not yet then. Oh, cool. Um, so yeah, you can see that I cut, actually I should have cut the tail a little deeper. Um, so because this, um, most popio all have this scoots of the fish, I just want to cut that off because it's really hard when you're not when you're filleting it. So. I am actually going to use, for some reason, that isn't a bad cut. But that's not the right knife. So I'm going to use a regular chef's knife to do this. Most times they'll say a deba, but this fish is a little smaller than I expect. OK, so there's many ways to do it. Um, I usually f cut it this way. Um, so you can fillet with the uh, comma on or comma off. But most times, if you're going for fillets, you just want to cut this on the commas on both sides. Okay, and then for the easiest way, you just pop that. That's going to come off. And then, sorry, there's some scales in here. And then you want to just cut right here, right? And you want to feel that um, bone. You just follow that, yeah? You see that? I don't know if the camera can catch that. Yeah. Put it in. Yeah? And then you just do the one same on the other side. Okay. And from here, you're just going to cut. And then if it comes off. Yeah? <laughs> and of course, like, the more you do it, the better you get, right? The so same thing on this side. Okay, so the, right. yes, the suffocation one is on your right when you're eating the fork, right of the fork. Um, so hopefully you can tell the difference is, it shouldn't, I actually tried it earlier, uh, it was a little hard to tell because the fish is still pretty fresh. I did brine both of them. Then again, you just finally follow this. So all I didn't want to put too much on it. All it is just a little bit salt and then just a little bit of lemon oil just so you can really taste the flavor of the fish. Um, okay. And then um, I'm just cutting off this belly part. So yeah, this is, um, we get the two fillets. I'm just going to cut this. What's your favorite kind of fish? That's a hard one. I appreciate all types of fish. Um, I grew up, my, dad, my dad's philosophy actually growing up fishing was take what the ocean gives you. Don't be picky. And, um, I know like there's some fishermen like, oh, I don't eat certain type of fish. That's not me. As a chef, I find it even more, I like the challenge of playing around and creating different um, methods of highlighting the fish the best possible way. So 
even though it's considered a not prized fish, I actually like that better because it's more of a challenge for me as a chef to make that fish taste good. It's, um, so I think a lot of things like that is a mindset. Um, I actually personally, if you guys heard of ta'afi, which is an invasive species, I very mindfully um, harvest certain fish and the reasons for it. Um, and you know, I could be, I could catch like, you know, 100 pulpy if I needed to, but I don't. That is just a choice, right? So um, I do harvest tapi to sometimes sell gas money, make a little bit of gas money back, but I'm very mindful of what fish I choose to harvest and why. Um, so that's also important, right? But going to like, do I have a favorite fish? Um, I think everything is a mindset. If you look like places like Florida, um, Florida, like uh, the, the turkey fish, um, the lionfish, was no one would eat it until there was this movement of chefs that say, hey, you know what, we're gonna take action and we're gonna serve it and put it on our menus. So now there's, a, now there's this huge support of people eating fish, uh, lionfish in Florida. So I hope to do that with Taapi as well um, in the restaurants. And you see that slowly getting there. Um, again, you know, like the whole stigma of like, nobody wants to eat tilapia in, in Hawaii, yeah. but everybody loves it in the mainland. It's just kind of just changing that mindset, so. I'm not saying that, you know. <laughs> but I, I'm just, yeah, I'm just saying it's just, you know, you just gotta just, it's people's mindset, so. And then what you're trying to do is just you follow. Once you get that angle on this, then the skin's gonna come right off. This again just takes practice. The more you do it, the more better you get at it. And it's gonna cut off the bloodline. And then um, whatever you do, uh, never waste the product. So you guys can use the heads and the bones. All that makes stock make. You know, if it, how many Filipinos over here make sinigang? Um, you know, I actually grew up making a lot of miso soup, so I never, I wouldn't use like katsuo. I would always take, always had bones and stuff that would just boil that, then take the meat out, and then add the miso to that. So, a, I'll do a kudo um, presentation, and if you answer more questions, you get a special plate as well. So give you incentives to ask questions and answer questions. Um, so, let's see. I actually have some um, papio already that I filleted. The one, I basically took the fillets, I cured it in a little sugar salt mix. Um, and then I cold smoked it uh, with a smoking gun for a little while, right before I came. So I'll be actually featuring that. I wanted to show a little bit more um, crea creativity and a little bit more method. So one, curing, and then two, smoking as well. So this um, is lightly smoked and then quick cured. So it's only cured for about an hour. Uh, salt, sugar mix, and then we rinsed it. I know a lot of you guys are gonna be asking for recipes. Um, so with that, I thought I was like, uh, should I give you recipes? Um, and with that is, um, that's what, are you guys, if you guys wanna extern with us and learn, that's your incentive to come and learn the recipes. So just a heads up, that's, if you want the recipes. Um, um, so the purpose of the curing uh, does two things. It one, it helps, um, You'll find that anytime you add salt, um, the fish will firm up. And then again, it's a preserved method, right? Even smoking. Um, so, let's see. Is there any other questions before I keep on going? Yes. I've only recently started it this year. Actually, like. To be honest, like three months ago, right before she asked me what I wanted to present on, 
Um, there's all these topics that Haley and I were talking about. Like, oh, we did that, we did that, we did that. I'm like, oh my gosh, what I'm going to present. Um, but I kind of wanted to, and which I'll be talking about, uh, segue into not just the respect for the animal, but um, as a chef, you get to make certain choices. And you know, not just um, me as a fisherman, how I kill the fish or how I harvest the fish, but also like um, the ingredients and, and farmers and all that, that we, we choose to support at the restaurant. Um, so um, I'll go into that. I'll have Robert eventually join, join and talk about that as well um, once I play up this uh, kudo. So actually, I'll be honest with you. I, um, I was rushing here, and I, I actually made a burial rice crackers for give this dish a crunch, and I left it on my pass at work. And I was driving here. I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot it. So I apologize for that, but I promise that the fish will still be delicious, OK? So let's, I talked about all the pros of Ikejimi. I know it's like, you guys, it's like, what is the cons, right? Um, if, if, if this is better for the fish, why aren't our fi all fishermen doing it, right? right. Um, it, it's cost. It's because it takes time, right? The, when, you know, there's fishermen, when, especially when you're commercial fishing, you want to catch as much and as fast as possible because that makes the most money, right? Um, so instead of you catching one fish, you don't want to stop and take the time to kill that fish and do the ikijime process. You want to just keep on catching more and more and filling up your cooler, right? And that's what usually happens, and that's why the ikijime process is it's not so, um, you don't have a lot of fishermen doing that. It's because in all they're seeing is, I want to catch as much fish because that's how I get my money. But if chefs be like, there's actually restaurants out there that pay premium, right? They, they, there's all these sushi shops, all, you know, like the top sushi shops here get all their fish from Japan. Why? Quality. All, that, all the fish coming from Japan is done in Ikejime, so the fish lasts long. It won't spoil as fast. The quality is better. So if we as, as, we as chefs say like to a fisherman, like, hey, it's, I'll give you four, whatever X amount of dollars more per pound for that same fish if you do the process of this Ikejime, right? And with that, you'll get less waste because the fish will last longer. You, you know, um, the quality is better. Um, so hopefully, I'm... I'm here speaking not just as a fisherman, but as a chef to hopefully start this movement of chefs to hopefully adopt this method. Um, sometimes um, I did realize when I first started doing it, because I wasn't really good at it, like the boat was rocking. I was like, oh my god, I was getting a little seasick too. So that, you know, there's all these little things, but um, I truly, I truly um, hope to practice it more and then hopefully start um, getting fishermen or commercial fishermen to hopefully start adapting that process as well. How much less do you catch? Like, what's the difference? Like, the pricing that's that that's hard to, like, there's, because local fishermen, there hasn't been any local fishermen uh, other than, like, very few, few um, uh, house, like, home fishermen, recreational fishermen doing it. I don't know anybody right now on the commercial level that's doing Ikijime. Um, there's a lot of fishermen, commercial fishermen, who, like, might brine their fish, meaning catch their fish and immediately throw it in a slurry, like the ice, that one-to-one -one ice cold water slurry. Um, but there's no um, fishermen that I know of commercially that go and harvest these fish, um, ikijime, right? But there's, there's um, a lot of, like when you go to, when you talk about like restaurants like Providence in Los Angeles and all these other, like La Marine, all these Michelin restaurants, they actually source and specifically look for ikijime fish, right? But it's the chefs that specifically go and say, I want premium fish. I want the best fish I can get on my menu. And they work with fishermen to go and, and harvest and, and source that fish for them, How right? How can they really tell if it's ikijime or not? Um, you will tell. You get one. You can tell by the spite. You can tell by the freshness. Um, again, this is smoke, so it has a little different color. Um, but you know, as a chef, if after 20 years of working with fish, you'll know when you see some a good product. You'll know when um, the the fish the fish was ikijimi or not. You know, I, I, like again, this is already four going on five days, and it's still like also like you guys ate it both. It's still really really fresh. Um, so I'm actually gonna 
one of your few lucky ones who keep on asking questions and answering questions, I'm going to get um, to taste the one I just smoked recently. So. And going, I, I know I said the word movement a lot. Can anybody tell me the difference between a movement and a trend? Yes. A trend is kind of like something everyone kind of jumps on to have not really, it doesn't really have a lasting effect on society. For sure, right? A uh, uh, trend is like something you see on TikTok, right? What's trendy, what people wearing, like, you know, it could be, I don't know, back in my, our days was like um, pogs or what, Teletubbies or, you know, I don't know, yo-yos back in the day. All those are trends. It had a beginning, it has an end, right? So what, when I say movement, the reason why that word is important is because a movement really makes a difference. It has, a, it has an impact. It, has a, it makes a difference. And um, so you know, not just me as a fisherman, but as a chef, I really hope um, you know, I just started learning and practicing this technique myself. But I really hope fishermen and even commercial fishermen adopt and, and um, use this technique. You know, it's the most respected animal, yes. Do you have any type of, I guess, plan on how you're going to spread EKGMA in Hawaii's group of fishing industry? Yeah, so I think um, one is maybe I, you know, getting in contact, doing an EKGMA talk demo, maybe on like a Let's Go Fishing show for like a shorter version, like a quick version. Um, and also talk to Ashley, who buys directly from all these small local fishermen, you know, through local EA, because um, they, they, she, again, she chooses who she wants to buy the fish from, right? And if, if you say, you know, starting one month from now, I will only buy your fish if you kill your fish Ikejime as a fisherman. If you want to keep on selling fish to her, you're going to be, start practicing that as well, right? So it started with these small changes, and hopefully these small changes ends into something bigger. So, yes? Um, besides the restaurants that you run, do you know if there are any other restaurants on island that I don't. I, I, again, this is, so Ikejime, I know it's a very old method, and Japan uses it all day and most for every, even their fish. They use it a lot for, um, even when they harvest, um, like, farm raised hamachi and ahi, all that is performing Ikejime in Japan. Um, it's slowly starting to get around the world, um, but it's still fairly new, you know. Um, it's a fairly new technique that everybody's slowly adopting, even though it's a very old technique and it's been in Japan for years. Um, so again, it's it's you know it's it's you for the future generation to um, hopefully me telling you, and this gets out and people watch this video later that they want to make a difference and they want to be part of this movement as well. So that's what my hope is for. Um, and then with that is, you know. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the restaurant, but let me, I'm going to just, sorry, I've been, I'm going to keep on going on my crudo here. But uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my hope that this is just kind of a new beginning to something, to something greater, so. How did you personally find out about EKG Um Well, I went to Japan. I've traveled to Japan quite a bit. Um, because as a fisherman, I went to Tsukiji, and I was like, what is that? What method? Like, what are they doing to that fish? Like, they're taking a, a tie out of the tank, and they're, they're spiking it, and then you see them doing the, the shinkeji, which is the, the wire method, right? Severing the, and you see the fish, like, twitching. I'm like, what, what is that? Kind of made my curiosity. And this is probably, like, right after when I was still in culinary school. That was the first time with, like, kind of, this is almost 20 years ago, right? And now, it never clicked to me until I was like, you know, um, wh what, maybe, what is that? Can I be doing it too? And now there's a lot of YouTube videos that's coming out. There's, um, there's an Ikejime Federation now that is in the United States that is starting this movement as well um, the, on the mainland, as, you know, kind of on the mainland level to get people to start practicing and understanding this method. So, and you'll see it, you know, people, you see recreational people doing it with salmon um, and different fish more in the mainland, but as far as Hawaii, very few people I know that um, practice this method. So um, again, it's still new for me, and I just hope to, I just want to share it with you and hopefully 
inspire and inspire not just your, um, you as future uh, chefs as well, but hopefully people watching, watching you know, and this video is going to be shared that hopefully other people get inspired to do it as well. So, yeah. All right. So, kudo, anybody know what kudo means? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Are you Italian? <laughs> Spanish. Okay. So then, um, yeah. Uh, I will just do a quick kudo. We currently don't have this uh, a kudo on their menu. It's something that we will be putting on very soon. Um, I literally just, I actually came up with the dish last night. <laughs> so. Are you going to run that dish in both restaurants? No. So um, I'll talk about a little bit of the restaurants um, in a bit. Um, so La Vie is our, um, it's a French restaurant. It's a kind of our, pretty much our fine dining restaurant. Um, and that is, right now it's a prefix menu, so it's only set menus. Uh, we also do a tasting menu as well. Um, and then Cura is our more Italian, Mediterranean inspired. Excuse me. Oh, the restaurant is located in the Ritz Carlton, Waikiki. So um, on Kailai Moku, uh, we're actually on the eighth floor, so some people might not even know we're there. Okay. So now that we know you and we go, we get a family discount. <laughs> if I'm there, I'll definitely come say hi for sure. But if you join the team, you will get employee discount. So we'll get there. Um, that is a huge benefit. You actually. Um, some of the benefits of our team is we get 25% uh, off uh, La VN uh, Cura, and we actually get 50% off on highs as well. So perfect, 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 um, good incentive for joining the team. Jen's over there smiling. And Can you do that on any fish? Do you do that to marlin or ahi? You can. Um, it would be a little bit more, I know ahi for sure. You can um, be a little bit more challenging on a marlin. Um, you need a, probably a special spike, um, a very, probably a very stiffer, stronger wire for that as well. But for sure, it can be done. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to. Um, Oh, sorry. I'm still on video. Okay, I gotta plate this fish before I change. And in the meantime, we're gonna hold any more questions for you. <laughs> sorry, I opened that up no, no, too no, no. early. Okay. Um, anybody know what a finger lime is? Anybody seen one? Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna put that on top. Of this. I literally, whatever I hand. I'm going to plate up one quick dish really quick. It is cured, but I'm just going to put a little bit more salt because it was a super fast cure. I didn't cure as long as I wanted to. We call this actually, um, it's not real pizza oil, but we, we call that in the kitchen. It's kind of like um, our special blend of herb spices. Um, there's a little chili, some basil, garlic. So I'm just going to do a quick marinade on that before I plate. I'm going to make this pretty rustic.
I'm gonna say I'll be hopefully putting on a crudo soon. So this is just I'm not sure if this is gonna be the exact same one, but we'll have one on the menu very soon. What happened here? Give me a little avocado mousse. Some nice radishes for texture. So I'll make a couple of these extra once we talk about the restaurant concept. And then um, I'll have Robert come up here soon and then um, have him talk about a little about his experience working at the restaurant um, and his role. And if you have any questions for any of us, then we can um, continue from there. Could any of you guys tell the difference between the two fish, by chance? I know it's still pretty hot. Appreciate the honor. And these are actually um, flowers from my garden, so. Cool. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a bit. Yeah, nothing too hard. I actually did forget the rice cracker. I really wanted that as a nice crunch component, but nonetheless, I'm pretty sure this is still going to be delicious. Okay, so it's pretty simple. Let's do it together. Crudo. All right, so um, a little about, I'm going to talk about a little about the restaurant now. Um, and then I'll play a couple more plates for um, someone who can answer some questions. I'll come up with some questions. And if you guys can answer it, you guys will get a small tasting of that, OK? So um, OK, so, so Cure is our Italian restaurant, Italian-inspired. Um, it literally translates to here now. And then La Vie, La Vie is our uh, French restaurant, uh, means the life. So some quick snaps of what our food looks like, or some of it might be an older menu, but um, Robert, would you like to come up? OK, so this is Robert. Robert works at Cura. I'll hand it over to Robert to kind of talk about how long he's been with the company um, and his experience. And um, Jen's around to help answer questions as well. And she has a, Jen has a sign-up sheet uh, later on if you're interested in either, either front or back. I know not everybody might be interested in culinary here, but if um, you guys want to start out as a hostess or even as a um, possible server train, um, there's opportunity for that as well. So, Robert? How's it, you guys? Uh, my name is Robert. I have been a cook at Kiora for almost two years now. Uh, I'm 24. I've been in the industry since I've been 15, 16. I've been cooking my whole life. Um, from when I first started at Kiora, a lot has changed, and for the better. Uh, Eric joined our team. We have a lot of good chefs uh, at La Vie, Highs, and at Kiora that are there to teach us and help us better ourselves. Chef Seamus brought in dozens of culinary books just for our benefit, for us to take home and check out anytime we want. Um, 
Kiora is, it's a fun kitchen. It's not very difficult in the cooking aspect, but it is pretty intense being in the Ritz-Carlton Waikiki. Uh, we do room service, we have our dining room, uh, so we are always fairly busy. We are always consistently hitting 80 covers a night. Um, that's just kind of on our slower days. So it is a high-paced kitchen, but it is very easy to pick up if you haven't been in the industry or you aren't cooking right now. It's a very good first kitchen to work at. Uh, we have a lot of people who have been dishwashers, started as dishwashers with no culinary experience, who we have brought up and are now line cooks for any one of our services, lunch, breakfast, and or dinner. Um, it's a fun, fun kitchen. The camaraderie is very nice and just it's a very tight-knit family. Uh, we all get along pretty well, front of house, back of house. It is uh, good fun when we aren't on each other. But uh, we all have our fun, and it's a good first kitchen if you haven't been in the industry. For those who have cooked, I don't assume it'd be too difficult for you. Um, it is a good kitchen, hard kitchen sometimes, but uh, we get it done and we have a good time while we do it. And like I was saying about the chefs, there are a lot of good brains to pick. Um, I've staged at Levy multiple times under our pastry chef, under our CDC, and it's just, if you want to learn more in our restaurants and different types of cuisines, you can always talk to Seamus about staging at Highs. They're always looking for hands. So it's just a lot of good uh, high up chefs who know what's right and what's a good way to go at things if you want to learn more within the restaurants. And that's about it. It's a good place. Thank yeah. Thank you, Robert. Okay, you want to say anything? Is there any other questions before um, I'll ask questions to be able to give away some, some snacks here? How much do you pay? <laughs> How much do you pay? Um, so we are actually on, on you guys' um, externship program. Um, I haven't 100% decided. Um, We actually, um, for starting cooks, we actually pay 16 right now. Mm. So, not okay. bad. Yeah. Uh, we do have, um, once you make your three months, and um, we do have a great referral program. So, um, if you want, if you, once you make your probation, you pass your probation, if you bring in someone, we'll, um, there's a referral program. Once they pass their probation, they, you, we'll give you $200 cash. So it's a good like incentive referral program. We believe that good people attract good people and no good people, and we hope that philosophy, um, we want to incentivize that as well. So. Is that with Bobby? No, this is the um, avocado. We have a few more minutes, so if you have any questions, um, now's the time to ask. Yes. Salt? Yeah. Oh, there, um, this is Malden's. It's, a, it's like a flaky sea salt. Um, I actually wanted to bring my uh, moshio, which is like a Japanese kombu salt from Japan, but um, I left that at home as well. But these are, this is a super good salt, sure. like a nice flaky sea salt, yes. What inspired you to come up with this dish? Um, what inspired me? I, I grew up doing catching a lot of fish and playing around and, and experimenting a lot of methods. Um, and this kind of showed uh, one, curing, like a quick cure. And two, um, I actually love to do charcuterie on my free time too. So I do a lot of house smoked meats. I do a lot of smoked pork. I do a lot of that, like even smoking a fish. So that's what kind of inspired me. Like I wanted to show something other than just do a raw crudo of just taking that filet and um, putting it on the plate. Uh, I want to show a little bit more in depth of flavor. With that is, um, you'll get, uh, yeah, you get a little bit more complexity, firms up the fish, and you'll get, um, again, that quick cold smoke um, really adds that nice element, a different element to that. Um. Chef, go ahead, sorry. How much longer does the smoking process uh, reserve the fish for? Um, that's a good question. Um, all depends, right? Um, you, if you do like a hot smoke, I've 
it actually pre that was one of the reasons why um, people started smoking it. Um, if you look actually the history of any smoke product, a lot of it is to believe that um, it was actually hung over a fire um, to keep keep it away from one flies and two animals, right? So when you make a fire to keep yourself warm, if you look under the, the history of what, how um, smoking came about, it was probably done by accident, right? Somebody killed an animal, um, made a fire to keep it warm, and hugged their meat up above the fire to keep it away from any animals. And the next morning they woke up and they're like, oh, what is this? Like, you know, and they tasted it and it ended up being amazing. And not only amazing, but it also helped preserve it as well, so. Trent, do you have a question? Yes. So, um, is there any other key difference than, say, for example, like when you have like a blue fin tuna that's bloodletted on the boat, other than the texture, flavor, and smell? Um, yeah. So you wanna, it's, if ideally is some boats actually have one of those, like the bigger boats have um, a water hose on, on the boat where you actually can. When you can cut the tail and then cut the gills and flush, shoot out all that blood. Ideally, that's what you want to do as much as possible. Um, you want to just eliminate as much blood because blood carries, again, that bacteria. Bacteria is in the gut, is in the blood, and it's in the skins of the fish. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Did you have students for the que uh, questions for the students, Eric Shepard? I have questions for the students. Um, how many of you enjoy fishing? Oh, everybody. <laughs> How many of you actually want to, like, seriously per, are pursuing a culinary career? Be honest with me. I, I won't be offended. <laughs> okay. It's a good amount, actually. Really great amount. Great to see. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just happy to, one, thank you again for giving me the opportunity. Um, it's always nice to give back. To where I came from. I know. Um, got a question back here. Yes. So, did you learn how to do this process by yourself or did you learn from someone else? Uh, by myself. I literally was interested in it. I YouTubed it, read more about it. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's. It's, it literally, what this process does is not just makes your, like, I was like, oh, my fish is fresh. But it literally makes, because of the chemical change in the fish, it makes it not just a fresh fish. It's a literally superior product. And that's, again, and it's literally giving that, that fish the deep respect for what, you know, it's literally giving your life. So if I can make the decision to, to treat it as best as possible and get a better product for it, why not do it? And that was kind of why, what inspired me to start um, Ikijimi. So, yes. Um, you have whole fish that you guys use in your restaurant, yes? Yes. Um, so with the bones and the waste, waste product uh -huh. of the fish, do you guys use that to make stock? Rather? We do. We do uh, like uh, fish, fish stocks and stuff. Um, we can actually add that to like staff meals. Um, but it's always, you know, we we'll always try to put it to use as much as possible. Yes. Uh, do you know anyone personally that also uses EKG to kill their fish? I personally do not. And again, it's, it's only been about, again, three months since I really started doing it. Um, so with that, I just really hope that um, I wanted to try practice it first before, uh, <laughs> before I try to show somebody else how to do it. Um, I'm still not super good at it. Um, but it's, you know, all of us start in a place, so. Um. Chanel, did you have a question? Yes, so, okay, so I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I started, I was a student that wanted to learn anything and everything, and I was like a sponge. And I'm still, to this very day as a chef, I'm humbly, I humbly say that I still have that mindset, and I, you know, um, I was, what I, what I always did was try to volunteer as much as possible, you know, um, a lot of it was unpaid and, you know, they're always looking for students to help with events, especially now I know with COVID opening up, hopefully that, ha that opportunity happens more. Um, but how I really got um, recognized as a student was I, um, and talking about scholarships, I actually got a couple of scholarships from, from LCC as well. So 
that's, I know that's the next step after this presentation. Um, but I was a student who, as much as possible, I would volunteer. Um, and a lot of times, um, I remember vividly what happened in this incident. It was, a, it was a Diamond Head Theater event. And the students were, students were scheduled from like a 4 to 8 o'clock time frame. And um, at the time, there's still a lot to do. There's a lot of cleanup to do. I, most of the students went home. And I was one of the few students that was like, I, I didn't want, like, there was still a lot to do, and I stayed back. Um, and with that was, um, <clears throat> the next day, I didn't, I didn't think nothing. I went home the next day, didn't think nothing. Um, the chef who was helping, I was helping out, called my instructors and was like, I want, uh, who was that kid that stayed back? Um, I want to hire him. So even our chefs now is not, we don't, like, I, if, you, if I were to hire you in the hiring process, I won't necessarily look at your grades. I won't necessarily look at your experience. I will to a degree. Um, but what we're always looking for is the one that is hungry, the one that has the intangible qualities of hard work and, you know, and you know, just putting, putting that love and the heart in whatever you do. It doesn't even have to be culinary. I know like, some of you didn't raise your hands as being chefs. But I think it's important to understand that no matter what you do, that hard work and that um, intangible qualities is going to lead you somewhere. It's not going to go into in vain anyway. I can tell you that much. Like, it will be recognized. Um, just put your head down, work hard, and whatever you do, and you'll be successful. So. OK. Thank you, Chef Eric. Thank um, you. I have, give a hand to Chef Eric.